the only I in Father. Genesis chapter 17, a few verses this morning. A couple of memories that I have from my dad. One was the first time he picked me up from school to go take me to opening day at, at the Astrodome. I, I still remember him walking in in his police uniform. They let him come to the class and get me, and that was pretty neat. One, because my police officer dad came in the classroom. That's right. That's my dad. Didn't know why I was leaving school. I th actually thought I was in trouble. He got me out to his car, and it was at the time it was an undercover police unit, so I'm like, like, what are, what are we doing? Why? And he wasn't talking to me, just sitting there. And he, he said, look in the back seat. And I looked back there, and my, a T-shirt and a glove was back there. He's taking the Astros game. I was like, yeah, that's good stuff. Another memory that I have that I know it's going to seem odd to some of you that this is a favorite, but looking back on it now, it is something that is of great benefit to me. Uh, and ladies, go to sleep. Don't listen to this. You, you most likely won't understand, and you're probably going to gasp. Most of the men, hopefully not all the men, because maybe you've had a little bit more sense than me. I didn't get it knocked out of me yet. But there was one memory is that my dad actually hit me across the head because I got a little too big in my britches and kind of bowed up to him. I was like 14 years old. I woke up a couple of seconds later, and he's holding me and saying, that'll be the last time I'll ever whip you. Okay. I never got another spanking after that. Those yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, but everything. Another time was the day Lex was born. He's not in here. Good. The day Lex was born, and I was holding him, and there's a picture of my dad next to me, and he kissed me on the cheek. That was a great memory, because I'm a father. But even still, just like most men, have this whole thing in our head where it's about me. I, I, I. And I know for the last couple of weeks, I've intentionally made the point to go, hey, y'all know what's coming up in a couple of Sundays? It's Father's Day. That's right. It's my day. My day. Me, me, me. Obviously, you can see it's up there. There's no I in Father. We don't spell Father about I. It's not about me. God never made fatherhood about me. Never made it about you. It's always been about him. It's a lesson good fathers maybe not have learned, maybe choose to ignore, maybe have not heard. And I know many of you are past that point. You no longer have your little ones running around, but their little ones are near to you. Does that mean that you can stop being a father to them? No, and we tend, people say, well, it, it goes back to Genesis that says one day you're, you will give up your child and they will go to be with their wife. That's, that just means they're out of your authority. There are many days where I had called my dad before he passed and said, what, what do I do? What are your thoughts on this? I have two other men whom I talked to this morning that I was like, Man, and we were showing each other pictures back and forth on my cell phone. And I, point, I realized that there is not one daughter amongst all three of us and our children. And I looked and I had to text them. And I say it to all, all of you this morning and to in, any godly man to say, thank God we are godly men raising godly children in an ungodly world. Amen. And this morning... I want to talk to you about the only I in Father. So with open hearts and open minds in Genesis chapter 17, specifically in verse 3, and a few verses there. However, I, while you were there, I'm going to backtrack. It's not on the screen, but I do need to give you some background into understanding what has happened in the previous verses where God said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. A verse that a lot of people, we, we need to memorize, especially as fathers. We've got to understand, well, that doesn't have anything to do with me as a father. Oh, yes, it does. Absolutely it does. He says, I am God Almighty. This term right here is him giving the Abraham or Abram at the moment his true and formal name, El Shaddai. And it actually is a couple of different words. And I'm going to break it down for just a moment, so bear with me. 
And this is the I where he says, I am, which is a common statement we've heard throughout the Old Testament where he says, I is meaning alone. When he says, I am, it means alone. There's no one like me, not one being, nothing. And we have a great detailed understanding of what transpired later on in Egypt when the great I am spoke to Moses and told him, when you go to my people, tell, who should I tell them sent me? I am alone. It is he alone. El Shaddai is meaning majestic and powerful. God's name actually conveys a different message to the reader and to the hearer. The word El we know is God. We know that that is his, his title as God. But the Sa means who and the Dai means sufficient. I am God who is sufficient. That is enough. That's all you need. Fathers, that is all you need in life. No, you don't need your wife. No, you don't need your children. No, you don't need your car, your boat, your fishing. Even though it's multiple types of fishing days, something related to fish. We don't need all those things. God is sufficient for your life. And you can look out and see culture where that has not been true for people. That God hasn't been sufficient. It's been my career. It's been money. It's been that big Escalade. It's been all the big tires. It's been the golf cart that gets you to the mailboxes 10 feet away from your front porch. It's, it's your lazy boy that not only has the reclining feature, but also will massage the neck. Because your wives don't love you like mine doesn't love me. But he is sufficient. If you put the word, if you take the, and it actually is broken apart even more. This word is, uh, the origin of it is sada, meaning uh, that is the root of Shaddai, which actually is an unused word in Hebrew language. They don't use it because it sounds too similar to God's name. And they just did not say it out loud. It was too holy of a thing to say. But this word sada, or Shaddai, as you'll see it, the root actually means Field, land, or country. It's creation. It actually, this whole name Shaddai, El Shaddai, explains God's majesty, His power, and His omniscience. He is everywhere and in everything. And yet men, today all over the world, will go throughout life not giving a rip or fit about anything that they have. Not even the breath in their lungs. Not the step in their foot. Foot in their step. The ability to walk, move, roll out of bed during the day. Feel that aching back. Feel that aching knee. We don't give God a whole never mind. And you can see it out in the world. You can see it how children behave at school. How they talk to people. The language that they use. Here's the biggie. It's been this way for forever. When the father is not in the home, there is a problem with the children. I challenge you to fight me on that. I got statistics to show you all on that here in a little bit. Because I know you how much you love nerdy stuff. But God is, in his, is majestic. He's powerful. And he is omniscient in everything. But listen, this whole st- this statement right here, we're going to go through it rather quick. This walk before me and be blameless is something people don't like to hear because it actually uses a word that we tend to change just a little bit because it seems more feasible and it seems a little bit more attractive to us to hear. But this walk before me, God is telling him, as you go throughout life, you're standing before me. And I won't go through the complete Hebrew stuff of it. But since God is majestic, powerful, and everywhere, we are always in a constant state of being before God. And men, we need to walk in fear of that fact that no matter what we do, wherever we go, whatever we pull out on our phones, whatever we do with it, whatever we put up on a computer, wherever we walk in the bedroom, when we close doors, when we leave and go somewhere else in the community, we tell my wife we're going to the store, but we go somewhere else and we do anything, God is always watching you every second of every moment of every day. That should scare the daylights out of us for any temptation to do anything that is contrary to his will. And yet there are people in the world that, again, just don't care. They lose sight of that. And it should always be at the forefront of our minds. God is watching. God is watching. God is watching. He is omniscient. He is there looking at each and every single one of you men. I know, ladies, you're you're hearing me talk about the men. 
This is your responsibility as you glean this sermon today. You bring in every bit of it and you repeat it back to your husband whenever they do something not headish, goofy, or whatnot. And that could even mean if they try to climb a six-foot ladder onto a 12-foot roof, you know, where they have to get up there flailing their legs trying to find the ladder, tell them to get down, call Billy Stewart. He'll come over and go ahead and do it. <laughs> but we are to be, we are before God, and as we move around in this world before God is omniscient, keep that in mind. But this next part, if you were translated in Hebrew, here's your disappointment for the morning. But it's great news for us, and you'll understand it. He says, walk before me and be... Who's, who says anything other than blameless? Anybody? Holy. The word is actually perfect. That's huge. Anybody in here perfect? Billy, come on. <laughs> no? Haley? That's my honey right there. No? Milton? Don? Somebody, surely, because this is a huge, huge slot to fill in our lives, men and women. Walk before God. We get that. I, I could daily remember that God is always with me. He is both in me and out of me and everywhere, all at once. But I've got to be perfect, be blameless. That's a huge, huge slot to fill in our lives. And guess what? Here's the truth. You can't do it. Men, you can't do it. Don't try to be perfect because you can't. Don't try to live your life expecting everything to come out perfect. If you do, look at the last bench or chair that you've made or table or something like that. Is it perfect? But walking before God means for us to be upright we don't like using this word perfect here, but at least we should all admit, and we all have admitted, yeah, I'm not perfect, I'm not perfect, and we should constantly admit that and know that, and that we are not capable of being perfect. Well, J.R., uh, I know that I'm a sinner, and we always go to that statement and say, well, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Here's the thing about using that term. While it is true, Abraham, like us who are in Christ, have been redeemed, bought back from the sinfulness and the hell of this earth. For him, you are redeemed. That should be your statement. I have been bought back as a child of God. You have been purchased. Who are we to walk around and say, oh, I'm a sinner? No, you're redeemed. Well, J.R., didn't Paul go out and say that he was the chief among sinners? The difference is, is Paul's not using it as a cop-out. Oh, well, I'm a, I'm a sinner. That just means I can get away with whatever I want. Well, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a mess, I'm a mess up. That just means you're not keeping it at the forefront of your mind to be working towards that perfection. Where our perfection lies, we'll get to it. You already know the, the Sunday school answer for it. But we immediately retreat back into saying, Oh, well, I, I, I have guilt and I have shame. There's no guilt or shame in us. It started in conviction for our sinfulness. And what had happened? Christ paid for it. Christ bought it. So that you are not having to walk through this earth in guilt and shame. We face conviction. And I didn't say guilt or shame. I said conviction. Guilt and shame come after the conviction. You feel conviction by the Holy Spirit. When you feel guilt and shame, it's something that Satan is doing to you, the demons are doing to you, or you're doing to yourself. We get into a pity party. Oh, pitiful me. Oh, woe is me. No, you've been redeemed. Yes, we are sinners. But that guilt and shame has been wiped away. There is conviction for what we have done. And that's between us and the Holy Spirit. But we don't add to our life guilt and shame. Because if we confess sins, confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.9 Let us draw near to a true... 
with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 10, 22. And yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify in God's name. So to begin, I know that's the biggest intro, and you're thinking, it's 20 after, Jr. I promise. It's Father's Day. I know you want to get home. you got a brisket cooking. Just remember my, my number, 4920116. If you have extra. I'll even take the gristle. But as we begin this morning, man must walk upright before God. Then he will truly bear a new name. New name. Brother J.R., we're not, we're not Mormons. I don't, we don't do the whole new name and thing. You, you are issued a new name by God. And I'll show you here in just a second. Bear with me. Don't think I'm a heretic yet. Just hold on. But look with me at Genesis chapter 3, or excuse me, 17 verse 3. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram. But your name shall be Abraham, Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations. Kings shall come from you. As we understand El Shaddai, and we understand that it is both powerful, sufficient, omniscient, we must take the first, that is the first step, is knowing who God is and how great and wonderful He is. You take that first step into achieving the first, his, a new name. But then the next step is, and here's your notes, the man must prostrate himself, humble himself, flatten himself out before God. I am less than He. You are not. The bee's knees, for those of you who are of numbered years. Hotter, hotter than a $2 pistol for the, the rest of us. Is that applicable here? I've heard that used different ways. For the younger students in the back, you're not that man. That's not you. You are not number one. He is. And we should humble ourselves, prostrating ourselves before him. J.R., you keep saying the word man. I keep saying man. I'm talking about this man. Well, I'm not ready to use that, use the word father yet. Okay, now I am. In order to be a true father, you have to walk before God. You have to humble yourself before Him, recognizing who He is and who you are. We are subservient to Him. You are here to work for Him. Your primary job as a father is to work in your family. The outcome of your family always has to take a look back at how you handled your fatherhood, what you did in life. And if you made mistakes in the past, okay, it's time to move forward and to work past those things. As a father, if we recognize problems in our children or our families or whatnot, it's on us. And we want to say, well, no, 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 it's my wife's problems. It's my kids' problems. You're the father. You're the one that created this family. You're the one that moved the family where it is. Has instructed them, led them, guided them, or maybe not led them, guided them, raised them. We can do that now. No matter if you're 80 or 90. No matter if you're 100. No matter what's going on. Start it now to recognize I do need to get my life and my fatherhood back in track with God right this moment. And constantly humbling ourselves before God. I did a wedding yesterday with a young couple and I gave the illustration in the sermon about Jacob and Rachel and how Jacob had put his family out before himself. He stayed back over the river and sent his, all of his servants, all four of his wives, all of his children, all of his livestock, every bit of it to go to Esau because he was scared his brother was going to kill him. And he stayed back across the river. What a coward. And he wrestled with God. He's, and God was needing to leave because the day was about to begin anew. And he said... Jacob said to him, oh, please don't leave before you bless me. He asked him his name. You're no longer you're going to be Jacob. What is this about new naming? This whole new name. 
No longer will you be Jacob. You will be known as Israel. And he humbled him. Technically, he hobbled him. Broke his hip. And guess what he did across that river and for the rest of his life? Went hobbled, humbled by God. God will change us if we allow ourselves to be changed by Him and make you something great and wonderful and mighty. And that's a message that we should send to our kids, our children. Remind them constantly. If you have an interaction with them, tell them this. And guess what He did? He went out and got in front of His family. Right where He was supposed to be. We don't need cowards in this world. We, mean, we need men. But this new name that I'm telling you about, you ready? So simple. Probably already know it. It's Father. Any man can father a child, create a child. But it takes a man of God to truly father a child. We need fathers who are molded by God, prepared and created. They're actively, constantly looking at this. What type of disservice are we doing to our children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, friends, cousins, neighbors, whomever, by not getting in His Word daily and learning how to be that man, how to be that father? We're scared of it, men. You don't read your Bible daily and we'll say, J.R., I don't read my Bible daily because you're scared of what it's going to do to you. We are scared. It'll hobble us. I've been broken by God years ago before fatherhood. And even though I was searching for a wife and I kept asking God, please, 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 I wasn't ready because I was still focusing on me. And I had a young lady tell me, my sister-in-law tell me, stop Worrying about trying to find a wife for yourself. I was trying to do it. Let God worry about your relationship with God and He'll take care of the rest. Three months later. The biggest, greatest blessing of her life. I'm, I'm joking. 100% joking because I am an affliction most days. But I am trying to be a good husband and a father to our children. But this, this name that Abram, Abram has as father is, it actually, this name Abram means father is exalted. There's some historical documents. We don't know of the accuracy of it, but it was believed that Abram's father was an idol seller uh, in the land where he had originally dwelled. And that one day that Abram is, a, again, don't that know if this is true. It's just a story that I heard years ago. That his father went off to go do something and whenever he came back, all the idols were pushed over and broken, busted up. And Abram's dad looked at him and said, what happened with all this? He said, one of the gods did it. He had broken it. Again, don't know if that story is true or anything. It's just interesting. But to have this name whom his father, who was not a godly man, named his child, Father is exalted. Could it be that the dad named him after himself to exalt himself but then God would later name him Abraham father of the multitude that is our legacy man the children that we produce now and that we raise and we father and we are a parent to are going to be the ones that are parenting more children you know the cycle of life I look back on my dad and thank God that he read the Bible to me in the, in the evenings. That he dis, whenever he disciplined me or corrected me, he reverted it back to Scripture. Do you think this is what a godly young man should be doing? Though it took years into my adulthood before, before the Lord finally got a hold of my life, but I thank God and I can look back and see that now. Will your children, are your children doing that with their children? Will, are your grandchildren doing that to your great-grandchildren? Are your great-grandchildren going to do that to your great-great-grandchildren? Are you leaving that legacy of the multitude of nations that are coming from your legacy? Have you thought about that? What type of disservice are we doing, men, to our great-great-great-grandchildren who are now sitting at home with a father who just decided to pack up and leave to go with another woman or, because of the day and age, another man 
What type of disservice are we doing now to them? Have you thought about that? The only I and Father is I am. He is what makes you into the Father you ought to be. The second point this morning is I must make you a Father. I must make you a Father. If you see that in your notes, it's right down there. Countless kids today are fatherless, near homeless. 18.4 million children, one in four without a biological step or adopted father in home. My best friend adopted uh, a child, beautiful, sweet young boy, and I, I, I want to hug him and love him as much as I can. Evidently, they put like a contingency that if, if something, God forbid, anything were to happen to them, Haley and I get him. There are too many kids, and they had to adopt. There are too many. I'm not making a plea for adoption. If that's within your heart and it's within your will, by all means, talk to God on that. But just for perspective, there are so many children out there without parents, without fatherly figures. You know of individuals around you, near you, that need that. Some of you are actually doing that. Brother Johnny even is able to invest in the lives of some young men on Sunday evenings and Wednesdays throughout the whole week. He's taking them to fishing tournaments, taking them around and doing stuff. And I'm not just elevating him in this, but he's got a passion and desire to love these young men and be that type of help to them. We need to be that, men. We have the opportunity to do that. Do it. Love on him. If I'm not around, you see my child trying to figure out how to tie a knot or a shoe or something, go and do it. My best friend, this is Anthony. I was talking to him. He's six foot two, not that big. I have told you all about him. Again, I've said it before. He's, he's a little darker than I am. But years ago, we were out hunting one day, and we took his boys hunting with them, and they were itty-bitty. Now they're, like, taller than he is, and it's great. I love it. The fact that his children tower over him. But we were out hunting, and he took a picture one day, and I didn't think about it at the time, but it was kind of like, and this is not an attaboy to me, I just saw his boy's shoe untied, and I knelt down and tied it. If you'd have seen a white man about 40 years ago reach down 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, a white man reach down and tie the shoes of a little black boy, what do you think would have happened to me? What do you think would have said to them? Who gives a rip or a fit? Color doesn't matter for anything. We're supposed to be loving everybody, being kind to everybody, no matter what. Research shows that when a child is raised in a father absent home, they are affected in the following ways. Four times greater the risk of poverty. More likely to have behavioral problems. Two times greater the risk of infant mortality. More likely to go to prison. More likely to commit crimes. Seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teen. More likely to face abuse and neglect. More likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. Two times more likely to suffer obesity. Two times more likely to drop out of school. Because men are not being fathers. Men are leaving. Not are, and we as believers, and again, I know that many of us have passed those years, we see things around us and we can inter intercede. We can act where we can. We can ask, what can I do to help? Even young ladies, young men, talk with the mothers. Interact. Be that. We are setting our future up for more hell on earth if not equal to that eternal place of hell for all those who are without God, without Christ as their Lord and Savior. Chapter 18, verse 18 and 19. Listen with me. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Last part. A father can be a blessing in righteousness and justice to his family and the world or an affliction, 
a source of sinfulness and injustice between God and man. I know that's a lot. It'll stay up there for a minute. Abraham has the propensity to be something great for humanity, for the people of God. And he will be. Just as you have the propensity to be someone great for God in this world for all humanity and man. Not just your children, but be that figure. People should walk around and be like, oh, what are you doing with your children? Your kids are doing this. Your kids are doing that. They say this. They're very this. They're respectful. They're not doing this, et cetera, et cetera. For someone to say, what can I do to instill that in my children? I would love to sit down and talk with you about this. I have resources here. I have more resources here. I have other resources in my library. I can help you out. If we need to do a men's class, I would love to do it. I still have it on my mind. It's a matter of time to do it. I want to do a parenting class in here. Not how to raise your children, but how to look at Scripture and open it up to the community. I'd love to do it in Hemp Hill. But we need to be intentional about how we are fathers. And to be understanding of the nations that we are producing out of us and what's coming after us. God has chosen us to do some things. And here's, here's a biggie in verse 19 that a lot of you probably don't like. And you're, oh, can't say these type of things nowadays in culture. You're going to get, ups, get upset people. For I have chosen him, male, him, the father, the man, that he may command his children... We could skip that last part, right? And his household. Mama's not in charge. Wife is not the commander of the chief of the household. The man is. Don't go elbowing. Don't be peaching. God employed it on purpose so that we are held accountable to him, not the wives, not the women. Not our daughters, not our children. It's us men. You're going to be held accountable for what has gone transpired in our houses. Well, golly, Jr. I wish I'd have heard this 30, 40, 100 years ago because then start now. Women, you may not like it. We are going to stand before God and we're going to have to testify to Him for what we have done, not you. We need to take it serious, men. We are the head of the household. And we are responsible with the lives of our wives and our children. You don't like it? Talk to him. But I will affirm it and agree with it and support it. Lastly, you see that it says that the we, this, this is so that we can keep the way of the Lord and then we will execute righteousness in this world and justice so that we can receive that promise from God. What is that promise? It is here. That He'll supply what you need. Need. Not you won't. Not what you want. Not that 80 foot bass boat. He will give you grace. He will give that so that your child will not be overtaken by temptation. And that comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. Victory over death. He will give us, He will work with us for His will. He has given us salvation for the forgiveness, in the forgiveness of sin, and He has given us eternal life. Now, this list is not applicable to men, it's for all. But men, we are held accountable for it. We are to be that Christ imagery in this world. We are not Christ, but we are to be the first image that everyone sees in this world. Our daily walking should be before God as an image bearer of Christ. If He is not the first in your life, make Him the first in your life. The good news is, and it goes in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother so that you'll have a good life. That's for the children. But we have to make sure, men and mothers, that we are presenting that imagery so that it's deserving of that honor. 
The good news is, as Christ redeems, he saves, and he can redeem you. If that has not been your life to this point, make it that point now. Allow Christ to be in charge of your life. Put God first. Putting off sinfulness. Putting off this worldliness. Putting off and down the phone. Putting down the remotes. Putting down the computers. Putting down the TV and watching ESPN for three or four hours a day. Get up and get out there with your kids. There have been days, and don't think the JR is perfect. I know I may look it. No laugh? Come on. Okay. But there are days when Lexus walks in and says, Dad, can we go play catch? And I'm sitting there. I just sat down for a minute, and I want to watch a cat video or something. And I'm just like, okay. And I get out there, and, I, and, and, and then it's him that's like, okay, I'm done. No, no, no. We got another hour. Let's keep going, son. Let's keep going. Once you're there, it's glorious. Once you get on the phone and talk with your children, maybe there's estranged children. Maybe there's estranged siblings, friends, family, whomever. Maybe there's someone in your life that maybe they're not living Christ's likeness. Maybe you feel ashamed of it. Maybe you feel disgusted by it. But our first and foremost action is to give love. But above all this, the greatest of these is love. The first love that was expressed to us was God sending his son to die for each and every single one of you and them. So that should be a priority in your life. And if you do not know Christ, I invite you this morning, profess Christ as your Lord and Savior. Make him Lord in your life. Make him number one. Then you will see a difference in your life. If you don't, money back guarantee. But you will. You will see a difference if God's the priority. Can I pray for you this morning?